Good afternoon. I'm Tracy K. Smith. I am a faculty member in the departments of English and African and African American Studies. I've been sitting here feeling, um, feeling myself to be in the presence of holy beings and then talking myself down and saying, no, these are people who have made extraordinary choices that we feel and learn from and um, aspire to serve in some way. And so I just want to say thank you. I'm moved and inspired by the words of um, gratitude. And um, I'm grateful to be part of this institution that is committed to honoring and making possible justice um, as something that's central to the mission. Um, it's my honor to be presenting the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal to Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Adichie is one of the most celebrated writers of our time. <laughs> I want to interrupt myself and say that Chimamanda is, um, is consecrated to the work of the word, um, which is soul work in a large and cosmic way. You have a vision that is large, but it begins in small, intimate, particular spaces. It is as attached to vocabularies of causes as it is to the dialect of the heart, let's say. Um, and I believe your work reminds us of what it looks like to look around at the small and the vast, both in and around us. Um, and I think that's what art does. Um, it makes us small and large at the right times. Um, let me tell you about Chimamanda. <laughs> Born in Nigeria and now dividing her time between there and the U.S., specifically Baltimore, Adichie is the author of three novels, Purple Hibiscus, Half of a Yellow Sun, and Americana, I knew I was going to hear that. <laughs> as well as a short story collection, a book-length essay, a manifesto presented as letters to a new mother, and her most recent work, Notes on Grief, which is a lyrical and complex and vulnerable reflection on the death of her father. She's won numerous literary prizes, among them the Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best First Book, the Orange Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, she's also the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award. She's received more than a dozen honorary degrees and has held prestigious fellowships, including one right here at Harvard Radcliffe Institute in 2011 and 12. Her books have landed on syllabi across continents and have been selected for several one city, one book reading programs. Sometimes I have a book that I love so much and feel is so important that I wish everybody you know, in a population would be given a copy of the book to read, which is precisely what happened um, when every 16-year-old in the country of Sweden was given one of Adichie's books. That was um, the book length essay she wrote entitled, We Should All Be Feminists, which was published in 2015. It originated in a landmark TED Talk in 2012. And three years before that, she delivered her first landmark TED Talk, The Dangers of a Single Story.
We Should All Be Feminist launched her beyond the status of highly regarded novelist and into the stratosphere of um, public intellectual. The intensity of notice for this work was certainly helped along by Beyonce sampling <laughs> a line in her song Flawless. And um, it didn't hurt that Christian Dior created a t-shirt emblazoned with the title which Rihanna was photographed wearing. So, <laughs> um, she became an icon of 21st century feminism for demanding that if equality is the goal, then we must honestly name one of the very real obstacles to genuine equality. She writes, some people ask, why the word feminist? Why not just say you're a believer in human rights or something like that? Because that would be dishonest. Feminism is, of course, part of human rights in general, but to choose to use the vague expression human rights is to deny the specific and particular problem of gender. Now, the conversation she sparked has been long and often difficult, and to all of the hundreds of students that are here with us today, I want to remind you that your task is to help carry this conversation forward by making use of the full measure of your gifts, your wisdom, intellect, courage, conscience, the particular contours of your own as yet lived experience, and your humility. For all of us are engaged in the mammoth and ongoing project of progress. And that's something that spans generations and geographies. It lives across constantly mutating vocabularies. And it's a project to which we are all, in our own way, urgently necessary. In her essays and talks, Adichie warns against the false comforts of a single story in a world that is roiling with conflicting and contradictory and reality-expanding stories, all distinct, all necessary. In her novels, Adichie has brought African voices to the attention of the wider world. She's cast African immigrant experience in stories that are once universally resonant and gloriously precise, particular to the worlds in which they are born. She is a superstar who is also part of an African literary renaissance in the company of my brilliant colleagues, Teju Cole and Namwali Serpel, that demands that we, each of us, work hard to understand the vast traffic of cultures, beliefs, and identities that swirl around and intersect with our own. Indeed, that we even ourselves contain. When Chimamanda spoke to Harvard's graduating seniors at class day in 2018, she said, make the human story the center of your understanding of the world. Think of people as people, not as abstractions who have to conform to bloodless logic, but as people, fragile, imperfect, with pride that can be wounded and hearts that can be touched. For your tremendous literary gifts, for your fierce commitment to moving humanity beyond the constraints of a single story, a single vocabulary, a single set of expectations, we recognize you, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, with the W.E.B. Du Bois Medal. not crying. <laughs> Tracy K. Smith, thank you for, where's Tracy? Tracy is a goddess of literature. And I was, and I am so moved 
by her introduction, just so moved that it's her who gets to introduce me. I um, think we first met years ago at Princeton, and I followed Tracy's work since I actually found comfort in your memoir when I was dealing with the immediate aftermath of my own grief, and your poetry has just always, to me, seemed able to do that incredible feat of being both really cerebral and also deeply emotional. Thank you, Tracy. I want... And, and it's such an honor for me to be on the stage today. It's such an honor for me to be, it's such an honor for me to be honored by the Du Bois, um, to get this uh, W.E.B. Du Bois medal for so many reasons. And I want to start with the first one. And the first reason is actually um, a man seated here on the stage who I call my uncle Skip who um, is also known as Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. I just want to say thank you to you because I think it's so important to give people their flowers, um, preferably publicly. Um, <laughs> Uncle, un Uncle Skip is such an icon, but it's, all, it's really for your work. You have made African-American history, African-American literature mainstream, normal, as it should be. And what moves me even more is that you understand the largeness of the black experience. You understand how we're all connected. You understand that in America and in the black diaspora, in Africa, we're black in different ways, but we are all black. And, and, and I deeply, I deeply, deeply appreciate you. You, um, I mean, you've had just the most incredible experiences, and we all know that he has um, had the good fortune of attending many conferences, including the Beer Summit. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> I have a lot to say about that, I won't. <laughs> um, I <laughs> I, um, I have family here, um, and I, I, the reason I want to talk about uh, two members of my family who are here is that in many ways they are part of my story of being here on this stage. I left Nigeria to, go to, um, to, to come here to the U.S. to go to college because I was fleeing the study of medicine. <laughs> I... <laughs> I had been in medical school for a year in Nigeria because, you know, in Nigeria, if you do well in school, you know, everybody just tells you you have to be a doctor and you find yourself just going along with it, even though you know that you want nothing less. In your, you do, the last thing you want in your life is to be a doctor. So I did go into medical school and after a year, I had to flee. Um, not only because I was writing little bits of stories at the backs of my um, anatomy uh, textbooks, but also just because I knew that I was made to tell stories. That's the, the thing that really meant the most to me was telling stories. And, but the reason that I could come to the US is that I happened to have a family member who already was in the US, my sister Rosemary, who is here, and her husband, Obi, who is also here. Um, and <laughs> so Rose, Rosemary and Obi were willing to um, give me food um, and a bed to sleep on, which you know, some things that one might re require in order to, to live. And so that's, that in, in some ways they made it possible for me to come to the US. And had I not left Nigeria to come to the US, I think I would still have kept writing because I had it all figured out actually. I had imagined that I would study psychiatry um, and that I would then see patients during the day and that at night I would then use the stories my patients had told me to write my fiction. <laughs> But even that wasn't consolation enough, so I, I, I really had to flee. And I'm just really grateful to my family for their support. My little brother, Kenna, is here. Um, and also my sister and brother-in-law's son, my nephew, Tokes. And I must tell you that when I called Tokes to ask if he would like to come, and I said, this is a big deal, I'm very excited about it. He, he said, mm, auntie, I don't know. Then I said, well, Karim, Karim Abdul-Jabbar is going to be there. <laughs> and, and then he's like, what time, auntie? <laughs> So, um, Mr. Abdul-Jabbar, I hope you'll give him the honor of a photograph at some point. <laughs> I, 
I, writing is the love of my life, and literature has mattered to me for so long, and it's, it's always so meaningful for me to have my work recognized. It never gets old. Um, I love selling books. Um, you know, there is that house in Nigeria that I want to buy, but, <laughs> but the most meaningful thing for me as a writer is to know that I can create something that means something to other people. And so what moves me the most is to hear from people who have read me and who say, you know, your work made me feel seen, your work made me think differently, your work um, made me feel that I was not alone. And so I'm so grateful for this award because, again, it just makes me think that what I am doing matters. And, and it's a gift. It's a gift to feel that what you're doing matters. And for the young people who are here, if you care about anything, please care about reading. Reading is so important. Reading is magical. Books are magical. And And I, and I think, I really think that one of the best ways to counter what, I, what seems to me to be a, you know, just really ugly tsunami of, of book bannings going around in this country is to read. The only way that we can answer to censorship of books is to read books. And so for you young people, I just want to make a very small suggestion. How about you give up social media for you know, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and read, read, read. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such an honor for me. <laughs>